Well, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 2 has to do with understanding yourself, and chapter 3 has to do with ethics in counseling. So let's go ahead and get started. One of the things I think you guys need to re remember, and I keep uh, har uh, harping on this, is the fact that if you have a problem, you need to deal with it before you can start counseling. And the reason is because if someone comes in with a similar problem to what you have, then what will happen is you will be not treating them, but treating yourself. You'll be dealing with yourself rather than dealing with whatever problem they have. You will try to interpret their problem through your own, uh, your own uh, mindset. Uh, let's say that, uh, that uh, your significant other has just left you. Um, or has left you in, in the past, and, you, and you're really upset about that, and you would like to do something about it, uh, but of course, you don't. And so somebody else, someone, a client comes in, and the client needs to talk about uh, the fact that they're depressed because they, their significant other has left them. Um, when you try to help them, potentially what will happen is that you will interpret you will interpret their problem through your own problem. And so instead of dealing with uh, their significant other as their significant other is, you will be thinking, well, yeah, but my significant other acted like this, and my significant, uh, significant other did this. So you'll be you'll be thinking in the wrong direction. You'll be thinking about yourself rather than, and your the other individuals that you've had trouble with rather than their, theirs. Uh, so that is that can be a potential problem in the future. And the, so this is one of the reasons why you need to deal with your own problems before you deal with someone else's problems. Uh, the more you think about it, the more you deal with it, the uh, uh, less impact it will make on you. Uh, let me give you an example from my own family. I have a brother that uh, served in Vietnam and uh, came back with PTSD, and it was fairly severe. Uh, PTSD, uh, it wasn't debilitating to the extent that he couldn't do anything, he couldn't work. Um, he did some strange things like um, he set up defense, uh, uh, a defense perimeter around our property, um, creating... <clears throat> firing areas uh, behind barricades and whatnot, uh, just in case, just in case, uh, as far as his concern, he was concerned. Uh, the just in case had to do with uh, the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, uh, who weren't here. <laughs> they were over in Vietnam. But uh, the more he talked about the war, and the more he talked about uh, some of the traumas that he went through, uh, the less severe it became. And this weekend, uh, I went home uh, last th last week, this week, uh, Tuesday through Thursday through uh, Friday, I was uh, in Indiana, uh, and when I talked to him, um, he was dealing with these these same topics. And I noticed that he was talking about the same things, but because he has dealt with them over time, uh, they weren't making the same uh, negative impact on him that they had had uh, made on him before. So before, if he talked about uh, certain things uh, that happened in the war, uh, he would get all upset and uh, he wouldn't be able to talk anymore. But this time he, he was able to talk about it. He was able to, to almost laugh about it. Uh, because he had dealt with it from a different perspective. When he went off to war, he was only 19 years old. So he was dealing with, his, with the traumas uh, that he uh, incurred as a 19-year-old. And now, of course, he's in his 70s, and he's dealing with his problems as a 70-year-old. So it's a different, totally different perspective. He's probably seeing his own mortality. And because of that, he is able to deal with this a lot better. And 
that's uh, one of the things that uh, so you, you need to deal with your problem and talk about your problem um, pretending that your problem doesn't exist will not not only will not make it go away but you will also ruminate on it you will think about it you will dream about it you will uh, you, you need to deal with it and you need to talk about it that's one of the reasons why counseling psychologists are so important because they give they give you somebody to talk to and they can give you a, a new perspective they can force you to see the uh, your problem from a more mature point of view because you get older every day as we all do and age should change the perspective of what happens to you so you need to deal with your problems and you need to talk about them okay let's go ahead and get started on chapter two there's McLovin. What's up, gangsters? Anyway, that's... I've only seen that movie once, but I, I remember McLovin. He's, he's making gang signs. Okay, I can barely do that. <clears throat> okay. Practitioners must realize that each person constructs reality in their own unique way. This is called constructivism. Constru constructivism focuses on how individuals describe their experiences in terms of personal constructs, in their own unique way, of course. A personal construct is an explanation of an event or series of events that becomes the lens through which the individual sees the world. These constructs are developed as individuals interpret and give meaning to their experiences. Constructs are not consciously developed. They are unconscious. Social constructivists focus on how relationships, language, and context influence an individual's or a group's interpretation of self, others, and the world. And why do I have a picture of uh, French troops during World War I? I can't remember. I, there was a rationale behind it, but... Uh, Personality is the individual's distinctive qualities, their traits, characteristics, behavior patterns. Personality is a socially constructed idea. Some of the strongest personality constructs are developed in childhood. These constructs tend to be harder to change because they are based on immature feelings and possibly illogical thoughts and are established by the undeveloped mind as truths. And, of course, child abuse can be one of those truths. <clears throat> the mother. My child is intelligent, handsome, and funny. The child thinks to themselves, that's true. I must, I must be intelligent, handsome, and funny. The father. He is too awkward to play sports. The son. True. I am bad at sports. The mother, no one will love you unless you are thin and beautiful. The daughter, true, I must lose weight and wear lots of makeup to cover my many flaws. There you go. Parents, people not like us can't be trusted. Children, true, people who are different are dangerous. Parents, you are worthless and will never amount to anything. The children, true, why even try? I'll become homeless and collect dogs. Culture strongly influences words used to describe someone's personality. Minority cultures will sometimes accept the dominant culture's view of themselves as true and use that definition to evaluate themselves. And living up to, to someone else's stereotype is, is very irritating to me. Um, I don't know. Anyway, you should never... You should always fight against uh, negative stereotypes and never, never do what the, that stereotype says. The constructivist perspective helps practitioners remember that their view of the world may be different from their client's view. The practitioner needs to remember to work within the client's view of reality. And of course, this is a picture of 
the uh, the uh, people that uh, were in Jersey Shore, I never saw the. Well, I kind of saw every one, every once in a while. I'd see like five minutes of the show. It seemed a little silly to me. Um, but when I, there's four girls and four guys, this is the situation. The only ones I know is the situation and Snooky. Snooky was the four foot eight lady that uh, I, they lived in a house. I don't know what. I don't know about. The, the reason I have the picture of, of Jersey Shore here is because their reality was totally different than, than like anybody else's. Their reality was lifting weights and I didn't the, the girls worked in a beauty parlor, I think, but they are a tanning salon or something. Anyway, they tanned all the time and they would go out and pose on the beach or something like that. That's why they called it Jersey Shore. Maybe I'm wrong. You guys can tell me when, how wrong I am. Uh, Snooky doesn't have any shoes on, and this one doesn't have any shoes on. She's got sandals on. I don't know. Anyway. When an individual family or group becomes aware of a con construct that is unsatisfying or limiting, the individual can develop another meaning for events or experiences and begin to realize that change is possible. But the idea is better if it comes from the client. The client needs to decide, I need to change because everybody in my family is a drunk and I've been drinking and I drink because everybody else drinks. I need to stop drinking. They, it, need, they, it needs to come from them. If you tell them, you know, you need to stop drinking, uh, that's not going to take. It's just not going to take. They need to decide that there, there is a need to change. Of course, sometimes a practitioner will have to work with, with pair bond uh, structures that have very different individual constructs. A husband may believe that a wife should stay home and raise the children, while his wife might think that she should be able to go out and work. Now, this is uh, a, an interesting argument that no one has. It's, it's a rare uh, argument these days, but uh, when I first started in psychology uh, back in the 1970s, this was the major argument. Should women stay home and take care of the children, or sh or can they go out and work without destroying the, the family? That was the idea. And uh, their in psychology, this was, this was a huge argument uh, that was going on in society, and therefore it was going on in psychology at the same time. And some of your older uh, theoreticians uh, said that if uh, there was proof, there was research that showed that if women worked, that they didn't raise the children, there wasn't someone home with the children all the time, that they would turn out to be juvenile delinquents. Uh, that's just what was going on at that time. Now, of course, we don't have that argument anymore. There are some people that are arguing uh, for women staying home and raising the children, but uh, there's not very many of those people out there. Systems theory takes into account the entire system with which an individual interacts. A system is seen as a complex entity within which interactions are as important as the individual. Rules are established by the family to teach what is expected or permitted by individual family members. The rules help to regulate and stabilize how families function as a unit. Changing one part of the family system will result in changes to other parts. If something in the family uh, dynamic changes, like a wife getting a job to help with the family finances, the homework. Uh, distribution will have to change to even out labor because she won't be there to be doing all the housework. Now, now the children will have to do the housework and the father will have to do some of the housework as well. <clears throat> Family systems may be open or closed in various, uh, in various degrees. In a closed family system, the family exists in relative isolation, with communication taking place primarily between members. Change is avoided. Members hold on to established traditions and values. And this is with a closed 
family system. Characteristics of open family systems, willingness to assimilate new information, and to engage in ongoing interactions with their environment. The family has no single correct way of doing things. As the family matures, changes are tolerated, supported, and celebrated. And the, this family is celebrating changes. Maybe, I think she's married, I don't know. Anyway, she's got a baby. In the family systems perspective, practitioners gain an understanding of how, to, how interactions within the family system affects clients. Family systems assist clients in identifying reciprocal relationships between their behavior and influences of the systems within which they interact. Clients realize both how someone else's behavior is influencing them and how their behavior is influencing others. The ecological perspective views people and their environment as continuously evolving. The ecological perspective is less concerned with cause and effect and more concerned with the transactions that occur between people and their environments. The ecological perspective was derived from the concept of biological ecology. This structure enables practitioners and clients to think about the reciprocal relationship between people and the environment. Ecological perspective has three important components. Person-environment fit. Person-environment fit refers to how well a person's needs, goals, and rights mesh with the social and physical environment. Uh, Person-environment fit. Uh, I'm, I uh, lived on a farm. I grew up on a farm uh, in Indiana. <clears throat> and when I joined the military, one of the things I wanted was that type of an environment. Uh, and I always feel more, far more comfortable in a rural environment than I do in a urban environment. And for that reason, of course, that is my person environment fit. We've always tried to find someplace away from the big city uh, to no matter where we were stationed. Uh, we always tried to find someplace out so that we, it could be a more rural setting. I felt more comfortable that way. And I guess my wife agreed because she, she always went along with it. Adaptations are the processes people use to sustain or increase the level of fit between themselves and the environment. Life stressors are issues that exceed the, resor exceed the resources of an individual to deal with them. And one of those situations came when we were stationed in, my wife was stationed at Rand Corporation, Rand Corporation in Santa Monica. And we lived in Northridge with my, my son, and it was, uh, it was more, well, rural is not the word you can actually use for it, but it was not nearly as urban as it, ha as it potentially could have been. So we were, we were in a uh, more residential area with more yards and more, more green and trees. And we had a swimming pool. That was kind of nice. It's the only swimming pool we've ever had. We rent it, of course. But In ecological perspective, behaviors are not seen as dysfunctional or maladaptive. Instead, behavior is view viewed as adaptations to improve the fit between the individual and the environment. The strengths perspective views all people as having strengths. It focuses on assets clients have, have developed throughout their lives. A strength is defined as any psychological process that enables a person to think and act in order to benefit himself or herself and society. Strengths are often developed when people struggle with difficulties, traumas, oppression, disappointments, and adversity and learn how to deal with those uh, difficulties, traumas, oppression, Dif uh, disappointments and adversity. They learn how to deal with them, and that develops strengths. Everyone has the capacity to develop new resources to make positive changes and to use his or her competencies to solve problems. 
Strength Perspective invites clients to discover, think about, and figure out how to use their strengths. This is different from traditional counseling because they tend to identify deficits, weaknesses, and problems. So this is a form of positive psychology where you focus on their strengths, not their deficits, weaknesses, and problems. <clears throat> When working with individuals, families, groups, or organizations, the practitioner looks for their strengths, identifies their resources, and invites them to focus on possibilities for the future. Resilience is the ability to survive and thrive in the face of overwhelming life challenges. Resilience is a dynamic process that is the outcome of positive adaptation in the face of adversity, stress, or risk like running through the mud. Resilience is not a fixed personality trait or an inborn characteristic. No one is either vulnerable or resilient all the time. Resilience is learned behaviors and patterns of adaptation. Resilience depends on the availability of protective factors. Risk factors are any influencing factors that can bring or predict negative outcomes on the functioning and overall development of the individual. They can include biological influences, individual influences, family influences, community influences. Protective factors are any factors that can exert either direct or indirect influences to buffer the negative effects of risk factors. Protective factors include strengths, capabilities, talents, coping skills, resources, and assets. Resilience represents both a process and the outcome of competent functioning. Resilience as an outcome involves the interplay of risk and protective factors. Resil resilience as an outcome represents the resultant positive functioning and competence developed when facing adversity. Practitioners using the resilience perspective start with an assessment of the relevant factors and then focus on helping clients build on the resilience they have developed. Now why I have this slinky, I'm not sure. Practitioners focus on helping clients develop a positive outlook on life and self-confidence Maintain, promote, and enhance protective factors. Recall successful events in their lives. Identify resources. View a mistake as a window of learning. Focus on the present and the future. Empowerment describes the process by which individuals, groups, and or communities take control of their circumstances to achieve their goals. Empowerment has an internal as well as an external component. The internal component of empowerment is also called psychological empowerment, control over motivations, cognitions, and personality. Internal empowerment involves the belief that the individual will make competent decisions, solve their problems, achieve their goals, and have a significant impact on the environment. The external component of empowerment includes the tangible knowledge, competencies, skills, information, opportunities, and resources that allow a person to take action and actively advocate change. Empowerment like resilience is a process as well as an outcome. New competencies learned from experience leads to new feelings of empowerment. Research shows that the more involved an individual, the stronger the feeling of empowerment. The empowerment perspective allows clients to develop a sense of power and competency as they experience using their skills and knowledge in new and challenging ways. The empowerment perspective helps people discover their strengths, identify their goals, and develop a plan to reach their goals, allowing clients to accept responsibility for change and experience a greater sense of empowerment. The dual perspective views an individual as interacting and adapting to two surrounding systems or environments. The nurturing environment is composed of family, friends, and close associates at school or work. The sustaining environment consists of the people encountered in the wider community and broader society. 
While European Americans experienced nurturing and sustaining environments as fitting together, other ethnic and racial groups experienced a poor fit between them. Individuals in the non-dominant group constantly evaluate disappointments in life to determine whether they are based on one's qualifications or on racism from the dominant culture. Minority members must develop a dual perspective equating disappointment with the hostility of the broader society. Minority members must constantly shift between the home culture and the dominant culture to choose acceptable behavior in each situation. The dual perspective allows the practitioner to attempt to understand the structural barriers that those in other groups experience. This perspective makes the practitioner aware of the day-to-day -day challenges minority clients face. And that is the end of chapter two. So let's get rid of this one and go to chapter three. Why do I have a dancing pair? Well, we'll see in just a second. Values are preferred. Con conceptions of people, outcomes for people, ways of dealing with people. Those are values. These are preferred conceptions of people, outcomes for people, and ways of dealing with pe people. Personal values influence your view of the world, your personal and professional philosophies and choices, your view of how people change. And of course, McLovin changed because he changed his name. <laughs> uh, he certainly wasn't a nerd to those two policemen in the movie, if you've ever seen the movie. And I don't even remember what the movie was called. Professional values often include principles of respect, self-determination, social justice, professional integrity. <clears throat> Areas where personal values may conflict with professional values include religion, health, marriage and family, education, role of the government, death at birth and death, and honesty. Ethical codes provide a brief exp explanation of what can be expected in the interactions between professionals and clients, as well as between professionals and other professionals. Ethical codes contain statements about what the professionals must and must not do. And these are the professional organizations. This is the American uh, Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. If you want to get a hold of those guys, they can tell you what their, uh, what their ethics code is. The American Counseling Association, uh, this is their website. The American Psychiatric Nurses Association, uh, this is their website. The American Psychological Association, the APA, and I am a member of the APA. I think, well, I won't say who, who else is a member of the APA. I'll just tell you that I'm a member of the APA. Association of Addiction Professions, uh, this is their website. International Association of Marriage and Family Counselors, uh, this is their website. National Association of Social Workers, here you go. And the National Organization of Human Services. Um... I have to tell you that uh, there are a number of individuals who graduate from the psychology program at uh, Diné College, and then instead of going into counseling, into psychological counseling, they go into social work. Um, I have had a number of individuals who have done this. I'm, I'm think not only at, at Diné College, but also at Ashford. A number of my students um, went into uh, social work. I had one a soccer player that pl play, played professional women's soccer for about five years. And after she was done, uh, she called me up and asked me for a recommendation uh, for her uh, to uh, attend a, a Master of Social Work um, program in Canada, up in Canada. She was Canadian, of course. Anyway, so... Just because you're studying psychology now doesn't mean that you can't drift into something else. When I was in college, um, 
53, 55 years ago, uh, 52 years ago, the people taking uh, psychology classes, uh, only a couple of them became psychologists. The rest of them became lawyers, as curious as that is. So there you go. You can do just about anything with a degree, with a bachelor's degree, but it all starts with the bachelor's degree. Professional competence includes practicing within the scope of competence based on education, training, professional credentials, and professional experience. One of the most important aspects of professional competence requiring professional self-awareness is cultural competence. Cultural competence is defined as the application of cultural knowledge about individuals and groups of people to the standards, policies, attitudes, and practices of the helping process to result in better outcomes. And the reality is, and, and this is something that I've learned uh, not only being uh, working at Diné College, but also working uh, at Fort Belknap up in Montana and also Salish Kootenai, People don't really understand uh, American Indians. They don't understand the whole desire not to be uh, part of the uh, the rest of the uh, population. Well, that didn't sound right, did it? Uh, to be part of, they don't understand the concept of wanting to be part of your reservation more than wanting to be part of the general American landscape, uh, to be just like everybody else. Um, they really don't understand that. And for a lot of people, they assume that the direction that you, you need to take is toward being just like everybody else. But of course, there are very few American Indian tribes that still exist uh, that are trying to push their uh, the individuals in their tribe uh, to become more like white people. It just doesn't exist. Even though <laughs> someone wrote me a paper, and that was in there, that, uh, that American Indians want to be more like white people. And I thought, wait a minute, this sounds like something that uh, artificial intelligence would say. And so I informed the individual that I didn't think he really thought that, and that he probably ought to write his own paper. Confidentiality is vital for information shared by the clients with the therapist in the course of treatment. This information is not to be shared with others. Without confidentiality, clients are less likely to disclose sensitive information with the practitioner. Okay, so how in the world do we get them to tell us something really titillating, something, something that's really bothering them? How do we get them to do that? Well, they have to trust us. And the only way to do that is to maintain confidentiality. It's not like we're spreading rumors. Um, a lot of people don't want to talk about this, that, or the other because they don't want their somebody to find out about it. Why maintain confidentiality? The potential for clients to experience stigma, moral obligation, for uh, helping professionals to follow the ethical standards for a professional, model of acting with discretion and keeping one's word, and of course, it's, it's legal re the the uh, legal requirements are there as well. Uh, one of the more controversial things that has happened over the last uh, uh, twenty or thirty years. Uh, was the fact that people were, were gay. Uh, there, at one time, that was very stigmatizing, that an individual uh, wasn't uh, heterosexual, but they were, they were a part of the homosexual community. Today, that has become more normalized, but once upon a time, once upon a time, it was illegal for people to be gay, as weird as that may sound. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that uh, the APA decided that uh, homosexuality wasn't a mental illness. That was with the uh, third uh, DSM, the, with the DSM-3, they decided that. Okay, so when I first started in psychology, that was, homosexuality was in the abnormal psychology text. 
And I can't see that I have it here somewhere. Anyway, I know, I know, that's how old I am. So this was always a stigma, and this was something that, uh, that you had to hide. People were in the closet. People are still in the closet afraid to come out because they're afraid of the reaction that people will have. With the expansion of technology into all aspects of our lives, communication has become more and more difficult to regulate. Cell phones, fax machines, answering machines, computers, internet sites, the limit, uh, limit sending confidential material on insecure lines. This is really bizarre because the other day I was, I was uh, in a, a gas station. Um, you know, it was one of those big truck stops, Loves or, or somebody. I think it was Loves. Anyway, I got gas. I went in to, to use the restroom and to buy some, uh, some potato chips or something. Anyway, I'm standing there and this guy's talking on the phone. The weird part was I couldn't tell he was talking on the phone because he had those earbud things in uh, and I couldn't see him. Uh, so it was really kind of bizarre because he's having this long con this conversation uh, and he's talking really, really loud. And he was talking about the fact that one of their friends was gay, whoever he was talking with. Uh, that one of their friends was gay, and he didn't like it. He didn't think it was right that this, that he, he didn't think homosexuality was right. It's really kind of bizarre having this, kind of, this conversation in the middle of a truck stop. Of course, probably nobody at the truck stop knew who he was, and it really didn't matter. Nobody knew who his friend was. That that, that didn't matter. But he was like yelling it at, at the at the truck stop. It was really bizarre. Anyway. Once upon a time, if you talked to yourself in the airport or, or if you were talking to yourself, uh, if you're talking out loud and, uh, and nobody could see who you were talking to, they assumed that you had uh, a, another problem. But now, of course, and I still can't get, have a difficult time getting used to people just talking out loud to somebody on the telephone and, and you can't see that they're, that they're actually on the telephone. A little strange. Boundaries are defined as borders that separate some types of entities, for example, parents, children, systems, um, clients, service providers, and healthcare workers. There are always boundaries. In all helping uh, professional uh, relationships, maintaining appropriate boundaries is an essential part of developing a trusting relationship with a client, like a doctor. If a doctor uh, will uh, if you tell the doctor something? Oh, I you know I I had sex with a prostitute and the prostitute gave me gonorrhea and crabs. Can you treat that? And then the doctor goes out and says, you know, a guy in three has gonorrhea, so don't uh, wash your hands after you know he's, he's saying this out loud to the nurses or something. You know, if the doctor does something like that, then that's inappropriate. That's inappropriate and he shouldn't be doing that. The boundaries are that he needs to keep this to himself and he needs to write it in the in the uh, the patient's records but not to blurt it out to everybody. Uh, not only to the nurses but also to the people sitting uh, waiting uh, to be seen. Relationship boundaries must be maintained with delicacy. Sexual relationships with clients are forbidden by all professional codes and represents the most common ethical complaints against helping professionals. In one study, 7 to 8 percent of the practitioners reported engaging in sexual intimacy with a client. 7 to 8 percent, that's a lot. Sexual relationships can have a seriously negative effect on the client. Cognitive dysfunction, identity and boundary dis uh, dis disturbances, uh, sexual confusion, rage and feelings of guilt, depression and emptiness, self-destructive feelings, increased risk of suicide. These are all the problems that you might encounter uh, with a, due to a sexual relationship with a client. Touch, accepting gifts, and self-disclosure by professionals are behaviors that have the potential to be boundary violations, depending on the circumstance. More damage can be done by overstepping boundaries than the help, than the help previously given. So you're actually doing you're doing more damage than you're doing 
than you did with your counseling. There's a difference between city ethics and rural, small town reservation boundary ethics. It is easy for a city practitioner to gravitate in different circles than their clients. In so smaller communities, it can be nearly impossible. And of course, this is something that you may have to experience. Working on the reservation, you want to, to deal with people in your own area. You don't want to have to move to someplace that nobody knows you in order to, to do your uh, to, uh, to work at, in your field. Uh, so it's, it's going to be difficult. Uh, let me give you an example. When we were in uh, uh, Montana, uh, the uh, uh, counseling uh, psychologist was actually, a she had a master in social work. She's a fabulous counselor, just really good. Everybody loved her. She was excellent. Uh, the problem was that there were only 2,000 people in the county. So if somebody needed to, if somebody needed counseling, she was the only one that, that was available to do counseling. Uh, so it's not like she could not interact with people that she knew. She had to counsel the people, the, all the people in the county, because there weren't that many, for one thing, and there was no other counselor to be had. So as it turned out, one of the people that she was counseling turned out to be uh, somebody that she would interact with at, at the, the local bar. And eventually, of course, they struck up a relationship and got married. Uh, so, you know, is, is, was there an pro ethical problem here? Uh, well, not in that environment. So you're, this is something that goes a little bit beyond what they're talking about. Now, you have to remember that the uh, authors of this text are from Indiana University, and Indiana, uh, you know, Indianapolis is huge. Bloomington, where Indiana University is, is, is fairly large, and there are, it's not a rural environment, so they really don't understand. They don't understand small town, rural, reservation boundary ethics. The desire to help the people and the community that you were raised in is very strong. When you know the client so before trying to help them, you're maintaining a dual relationship, and you should try to avoid this. Be aware that if you take on this risk, you are possibly an ethical violation. Another challenge during your professional relationship is how much information about yourself you should disclose to the client. Self-disclosure should only be used in the best interest of the client, certainly not the practitioner. And I. And I'll have to admit that uh, as my, one of my teaching techniques is to tell you stories about from my own life. Now, the reality probably is that uh, Dr. Russ, uh, Dr. Barber, and Dr. Begay probably don't use the same techniques. Uh, but I learned to do this up on the, uh, the uh, Fort Belknap Reservation uh, because stories seem to give you a richer understanding of, of these topics, and that's one of the reasons why I do it. They have a different technique, that's fine. After the dance is over, after the professional relationship is over, all ethical code strictures are removed. But a practitioner needs to be careful about how much contact they have with an old client to avoid damage due to confusion. The power differential remains, seeing you out of uh, you out of the professional context may disclose vulnerabilities. It will be difficult to accept this client professionally in the future. So if you ever do decide that uh, you want to date a client, then that is probably it as far as counseling that individual. Now you know why I had the picture at the beginning of the chapter. There you go. Now you know why. Let me go back. Most codes of ethics discuss the following ethical issues related to assessing clients. The assessment procedure or instrument should be within their scope of practice, education, and training. Clients should be fully informed about the procedure and be included in the procedure in a collaborative way. Appropriate instruments or procedures should be selected based on the assessment question. Assessment instruments and procedures used should be standardized 
and include normative data appropriate for culturally diverse or disabled clients. When administering scoring and interpreting instruments, appropriate procedures should be adhered to. Clients should be given a clear and complete explanation of the assessment results. All test and interview data should be kept secure and released only to individuals who are competent in interpreting the data. Informed consent <clears throat> means full disclosure of the purposes, goals, techniques, and procedure rules for assessment and counseling approaches used in language that is understandable to the client. And of course, the joke says, would you prefer Freudian union or voodoo? <laughs> Legal violations are distinct from ethical violations. Ethical challenges are generally brought before a state licensing board, but can originate from a professional organization. Legal obligations to clients include duty to care, duty to respect privacy, duty to maintain confidentiality, duty to inform, duty to report, duty to warn. Confidentiality is not absolute. Laws vary by state. It is important to keep up to date in your own state laws concerning confidentiality requirements and expectations. I do not counsel, and I have never counseled in Arizona or New Mexico, so I do not under, I don't don't know your state laws. I haven't needed to. Malpractice is defined as negligence, in which a professional fails to follow generally accepted standard, uh, standards of the profession, resulting in injury to the client. The client must prove four things about the practitioner to recover damages. The practitioner owed the client a duty to conform to a particular standard of conduct. The practitioner had an obligation to follow defined standards of care. The practitioner breached that duty by some act of omission or commission in the professional practice. The client or others suffered measurable damage or injury. The practitioner's con conduct was uh, the direct or proximate cause of the damage. The top five reasons for malpractice of practitioners in the United States are increased incorrect treatment, sexual impropriety, breach of confidence, failure to diagnose incorrect diagnosis, or suicide of the patient. If a practitioner loses in court, there may be several consequences. They may be fined for damages, uh, punitive damages, or for further counseling, uh, but they may lose their license. They may lose, of course, they'll lose their reputation. Future difficulties in obtaining malpractice insurance. The court case, whether won or lost, might damage the practitioner financially, emotionally, or professionally. And obviously, this, this guy is suffering emotionally. Minimizing the risk of ethical or legal challenges, adhere to up-to-date practice methods, good documentation of practices, maintain maintenance of appropriate boundaries with your clients, no multiple relationships. So don't counsel your friends, don't counsel your relatives, and don't counsel your significant others. The following activities may lead to malpractice. Sexual relationship with client. Practicing beyond your scope of competency, fraudulent billing, violation of reporting laws, breach of confidentiality, or refusal to provide records. Ethical dilemmas involving making a choice between two or more relevant but contradictory ethical directives, where every alternative results in some type of undesirable outcome for one or more persons. Damned if you do, no matter which you pick. Reamer in 1995 describes two principles that can guide practitioners in resolving ethical dilemmas. 
beneficence, where the practitioners should take action intended to help or benefit others. Non-malfeasance, where the practitioner should act without malice in order to do no harm. Elaine Congress, a social worker, came up with the ethic model of decision-making in 2000. And that's Elaine right there. Examine all the relevant client, personal agency, professional, and societal values, including personal, societal, cultural, agency, client, and professional values. Think about the ethical standards of your professional code of ethics and relevant laws. Hypothesize about all the possible consequences of different decisions. Identify all who might benefit and all who might be harmed. It is often necessary to research potential consequences of possible decisions on all those involved and consult with supervisors and colleagues as you begin to formulate choices. When a supervisor, colleague, or consultant is involved, the final decision must take their thoughts into consideration. And that is the end of the chapter, and that is the end of the lecture. Next week, we will chat. T tackle chapter four, I believe. So I'll see you next week.